Hi, it's uh, Jean Carapigny here, market access scientist uh, at CNC. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to uh, share with you the the results uh, and some of the, the concluding remarks related to a publication um, published in the Journal of Medical Economics recently. Uh, the title of the publication was a comparative review of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in, in South Africa. But uh, before I get started uh, on the content of the, the presentation, just a very big thank you to the uh, the organizers at ISPO South Africa chapter for putting together this uh, panel conversation and for uh, inviting a presentation on the, the content uh, of this publication. Um, so thank you very much uh, again to the, the organizers, uh, appreciate the, the opportunity and I hope the, the next uh, 15 slides of content um, is, uh, is a contribution uh, of some thoughts, uh, independent thoughts uh, related to the pharmacoeconomic guidelines and potential areas uh, for further development in the, in the future. So, um, as I mentioned, the uh, the paper published in the Journal of Medical Economics uh, was a comparative review of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa and uh, took the, the SAA guidelines and compared them to uh, a group of uh, six middle-income countries and six um, high-income countries. Um, and I'll, I'll get into the details of how those were selected in just a few moments. Um, this was published in the Journal of Medical Economics and just in the, the interest of full disclosure I serve as an edit editorial board member uh, at the, the journal um, but um, I assure you that the peer review process that applies to authors and um, editorial board members are precisely the, the same so this paper went through a rigorous uh, peer review process uh, with some very um, interesting uh, conversations and uh, to and froing between the uh, independent and blinded reviewers. Um, so it went through there that process, um, as I mentioned, um, and it was recently published uh, in the the journal. Um, it is available um, online uh, for downloading as a PDF. Um, should you want to uh, to read it, um, I would like to strongly recommend that you do uh, read the uh, the content of the the paper, um, just because um, 15 slides uh, that summarise the, the content of the the conversation uh, will not do uh, complete justice to what is uh, presented as either results and also discussed as some of the. Um, uh, observations related to the, the results as they compare to other countries. So uh, a PDF is available online and um, I'd be happy to share a link on f of where to obtain a copy of the of this publication or alternatively ISPO South Africa chapter may already have um, uh, circulated that PDF um, and sent that to you. So uh, in terms of, of overview and where the uh, development of the manuscript um, started. The, the overall objective of the, the paper was to compare the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa to other middle and high income countries. And the idea w was born uh, some time ago when we were doing uh, work for clients in South Africa where there was a need to familiarize ourselves with the, the content of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines bec before executing some work. And um, so we are, we are pretty familiar with the, the content and what the expectations were from the Department of Health. Uh, but then we were requested to, to do some uh, cost-effective evaluations in Portugal. Um, so again, as part of our due diligence, we familiarized ourselves with the, the Portuguese pharmacoeconomic guidelines. And we found that there were differences between the South African and the, the Portuguese. Uh, we didn't think much of it uh, at that stage um, until we were requested to, to do some other work uh, in Egypt. And if one compares and, and then when we read the Egyptian guidelines and compared it to the South African, again we found the, the same sort of differences. So, so we thought uh, that it would be a good idea to expand this, uh, this type of comparative review beyond just including a, an Egyptian and a Portuguese comparison to, to a South African pharmacoeconomic guidelines, but have a more systematic and methodical way uh, for comparing South Africa's guidelines with other countries. So that's why we chose um, a group of middle income countries and a random sample of high income countries and we compare the, the key features of these guidelines uh, to identify areas of commonality but more importantly where there were differences um, because that was our um, experience in working with, uh, with different guidelines in different markets but then to elaborate, identify and elaborate uh, priority areas for further development uh, given that there were the systematic differences that we are seeing and then provide suggestions for further development in the, in the future. 
So briefly, the, the methods that we uh, employ, this is a comparative review. Um, ISPOR, the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, um, has a very useful online repository uh, that summarizes the pharmacoeconomic guidelines between countries according to certain dimensions. Um, these are, are listed as, as follows. So they will list the, uh, the title and the year of the, the document. Um, that is, the document here refers to the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in that specific country. The affiliation of authors the purpose of the document, the disclosure, perspective, indication, and the, the list goes on. Equity issues, total costs, etc., etc. And this is a very useful way to benchmark key features of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines between countries um, and identify similarities and, and differences. Um, we generally found that using only this comparative table was insufficient because there are subtle nuances and more glaring nuances th th that exist uh, between uh, pharmacoeconomic guidelines. So we did manual searches of comparative uh, comparator country guidelines. Uh, we obtained the, the 12 guidelines for the comparator countries um, that I'll be mentioning in, in just a few moments. Um, and those are available um, here um, if you should wish to uh, peruse them, or they're also alternatively available on the, the ISPOR webpage. I believe that they're, they're all there the last time we, we checked a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and these uh, the, the online ESPOR resources are reviewed uh, annually by in-country professionals, ESPOR staff members and ESPOR members. So uh, for all intents and purposes, this uh, online repository uh, of information serves as a useful, regularly updated um, a hub of info that can be used for this type of comparative um, policy analysis. So that's what we, we did. Uh, we applied this flowchart. Uh, to identify a group of middle income countries because those were uh, those are um, were in our opinion the the next best comparator of an emerging market uh, so what was included was egypt brazil colombia uh, cuba malaysia and mexico uh, we also disaggregated it into high income countries and there were a total of 15 there that were eligible for inclusion we picked a random sample of six and that was um, germany ireland norway portugal new zealand and and the netherlands um so the the distribution of the the countries uh, um is a mix of latin america africa europe southeast asia um and uh, so it's not every single country in the, the world, but it's a, a fairly large sample. And to my knowledge, uh, this is a first comparative review that's available um, in the evidence base that compares South Africa to the other 12 um, countries. So on to uh, some of the, the first uh, initial observations that we made and that the paper discusses in, in far greater detail is the uh, regarding study perspective and, and costs is South Africa's uh, suggested perspective for pharmacoeconomic evaluations is that of a third party payer perspective so in other words that of a, a private medical scheme um, and if one looks at the guidelines in other countries in, in contrast um, guidelines in high income countries require a societal perspective um, for instance uh, in Portugal it stipulates that a societal perspective should be disaggregated um, into a third party payer perspective and then also include a societal perspective and and third party pay here um, is not comparable to the way the term is used in the South African context. In South Africa it's very specific that the perspective is that of the, the medical scheme, uh, private health insurance companies. Um, third party pay perspective here in Portugal refers to the uh, National Health um, uh, Service and specifically hospitals that are responsible for the provision of healthcare services, development of formerly reimbursement of um, healthcare providers, so manufacturers, uh, consumables coming into hospitals, uh, physicians, etc., etc. So, um, so that is a third-party pay uh, uh, perspective or the hospital perspective. So, uh, another example is Norway. It imposes some limitations on a societal perspective, and the and the paper provides uh, some examples. Um, all middle-income countries included in this analysis require a societal perspective. So. Um, South Africa appears to be the, the only country uh, amongst the, the sample that we analyzed that uh, uh, limits the perspective of a study to that of private health insurance companies uh, and um, specifically third party pay perspective. This has, has an impact on the type of costs that are included, uh, particularly indirect costs. Uh, and this is a direct quote from 
um, the uh, guidelines in South Africa is that indirect costs uh, should not be included in the, the submission and um, I believe there's, there's another sentence that's added to it only um, if it is uh, motivated should it be included but for all intents and purposes for the average economic analysis the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa do not encourage uh, at all the inclusion in I of indirect costs mostly because of this third party uh, payer perspective that is limited to medical schemes and, and and this is unlike the way indirect costs are managed by high-income countries, Portugal, the Netherlands and Ireland, where they require both direct and indirect costs uh, to be listed um, separately. Uh, Germany, for instance, it will consider indirect costs um, as it relates to productivity because it's interested, uh, it is interested in um, understanding what the, the total economic impact is on all the insurance uh, that exists within the, uh, the German healthcare system, given that it's a social health insurance uh, system, it is in, uh, interested in und understanding what is a value contribution of this healthcare technology uh, by taking into account whether it contributes to productivity gains uh, in the economy um, and as those indirect costs which are uh, separately itemized but included um, in the pharmacoeconomic evaluation. Um, likewise, in, in Norway, productivity gains and cost due to treatment are, are not compulsory, uh, but they are generally included. But they are disaggregated, they are not lumped together, and they're clearly delineated which are direct and which are indirect. Uh, costs so that the evaluator has a better understanding of what is the uh, the relative contribution um, of each of the type of costs to the the total results. In all other middle income countries, so Mexico, Brazil, um, Egypt, Cuba, and Malaysia, they recommend the inclusion of a direct and indirect medical costs. Uh, the only country that um, uh, explicitly excludes it is Colombia, where it states that. Um, uh, inclusion of direct medical costs and excludes changes in productivity or costs or benefits uh, in other sectors of society. So overall, in general, um, South Africa is the only uh, country that uh, explicitly um, uh, discourages the use of indirect costs um, and Colombia is the only other country that is comparable to South Africa in, in this respect. Um, from a modeling perspective, in developing a pharmacoeconomic model, is it appears that the guidelines in South Africa actively discourage the use of complex models. Um, and the, the paper provides a direct quote of what um, it states, um, and uh, I believe that the, there's a preference uh, that is stated there that simple models are preferred above complex models. Uh, where a simple model is, is a, appropriate. Um, however, a unique feature of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines is that a, a, a model, an economic model, must be lodged with the Department of Health prior to the uh, development of a full pharmacoeconomic submission. So there is this uh, pre-approval mechanism that the Department of Health have built into the pharmacoeconomic guidelines to require that the uh, pharmacoeconomic um, um, a submission developer, so the mo manufacturer or the, the consultant, must uh, submit the, the model for pre-approval before the pharmacoeconomic guidelines, uh, before the pharmacoeconomic submission is, is finally submitted uh, and further research is done um, in that area. And if you compare this pre-approval, um, it doesn't exist in any other country. So all high-income countries permit the, the use of pharmacoeconomic modeling and emphasize that assumptions and data sources be clearly documented. So no mention of a pre-approval um, process um, at all. Uh, but the, the text of a lot of the, the guidelines do state that the, uh, the type of modeling that is used should be appropriate for the, the research question. Uh, and the two need to, to justify each other. Um, and be tightly linked with each other. And the same thing is also mentioned uh, at the level of middle income countries. Um, so for example, researchers in Brazil have the flexibility uh, to develop a model consistent with the primary research question. Um, and this is a theme that comes up continuously across the um, across the, the comparative review and across um, countries that it must be appropriate for the, the research um, question and no, um, and no preference for either simplicity or complexity. Um, I'll return to this point in, in just a few minutes. Mexico and uh, Egypt uh, requires a description of how the model was validated, so complete transparency around the structure, data and assumptions. And in Colombia the mathematical decision modeling again must follow um, some guidelines around the uh, transparency of it. So description, justification, model structure, assumptions, source of information of the, the parameters, um, etc, etc. So, um, um, I think 
and it appears that the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa conflate two related issues. Um, one is the complexity and simplicity which operates on one axis. Another is transparency and opacity um, or, or opaqueness. And uh, the two are related concepts but they're different uh, in the sense that complexity refers to um, the ability of a pharmacoeconomic analysis to accurately reflect uh, clinical practice uh, environment uh, within a country. Um, and this is where complexity um, versus simplicity is important. If you oversimplify a model, then you are not truly uh, representing the, 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 the full complexity of the clinical practice, uh, particularly in uh, in the context of oversimplification of, of a model. If it is um, too complex, uh, then maybe you are overstating the clinical environment. So I believe um, that there, there should be, uh, the whether it's simple or complex, should be appropriately linked to the research question. Um, I'll talk about the, uh, the blocks um, in just a moment. And uh, with relate to transparency, the, these concepts um, are, are not uh, discussed in the pharmacoeconomic guidelines, not in the, the sense that as they're related to complexity. So um, the quadrants uh, here is, uh, it appears that the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa have a preference for, for simple models, uh, and I'm assuming simple and transparent models, uh, but in the piece of research uh, recently published, I'm motivating for a shift from simplicity, which has a potential risk of uh, under-representing uh, or inaccurately representing clinical practice in environment, um, of having a shift from simplicity to complexity. and. A personal preference uh, would be is that I would far prefer to work, work with a complex model that is entirely transparent because then I can fully interrogate the full complexity of the, that model rather than working with an oversimplified model and trying to incrementally improve it based on factors that have not been included. Um, ideally uh, what we need to avo avoid as much as possible is complex and opaque models. Uh, this is problematic and this is a quadrant that we should try to avoid as much as possible and uh, and I would want to argue that a lot of the pharmacoeconomic um, analysis that have been done in the past in South Africa uh, are not sufficiently transparent uh, in the, the methods, data sources, uh, methodology that's been used. So a lot of it is sitting here, a lot of it is sitting in these quadrants. Department of Health would prefer this scenario over here, but I'm arguing that we need to shift from simple up to, to complex um, so that we have a full appreciation for uh, for the true value contribution of a newer technology. And a good example in this instance would be a lot of biologic medicines that are, are being released uh, over the, the past decade in, in South Africa. These are complex molecules um, entering uh, into complex therapeutic areas uh, with complex uh, modes of action. Um, and the type of research question that is associated with the, the use of these complex technologies should be appropriately, appropriately matched with a, a method uh, that accurately reflects the, the appropriate use of, of these technologies and that values the, uh, the contribution of this new technology to the, the economy in general. So this is ideally the, the quadrant th that I believe we should be operating in and I think the pharmacoeconomic guidelines, if it were redrafted into pharmacoeconomics 2.0 uh, for instance, um, if it were to, to refocus on, on this area, I think it would be a significant uh, improvement in the, uh, in the future. Um, another dimension that is uh, not included in the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa is that of financial impact analysis or also known as uh, budget impact analysis a and it's just simply not there. Um, if you compare it to other middle income countries, uh, it is either required or recommended across the board from Brazil all the way to Colombia. And if you look at all um, high income countries, it's also required or, or recommended in the inclu an inclusion of uh, budget impact analysis. And all these examples that are cited over here in Germany, Portugal, Brazil, Cuba, it's all about understanding what the, the final economic impact is um, on the national health care budget, on the insurance and on the, um, the state to be able to fund the introdu introduction of, of this newer technology on a, on a per insurance or per member basis, per year, per annum, depending on what the, the, the denominator is. So Germany um, requires a budget impact analysis, it's mandatory and, and from there they determine whether it is affordable for German to insurance. 
coherent given that it's a social health insurance system in Portugal that is being used uh, excuse me in Germany that is being used in Portugal um, they uh, the the state manages a fairly large public health care budget which includes a medicine budget they also want to understand what the estimated impact is of a new health technology so that's critical important and the exact same thing happens in Brazil and Cuba but we don't have um, the same requirement for these type of budget impact analysis in South Africa's pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Um, a related theme which um, answers the, the question of why uh, are we seeing these sort of systematic differences that exist between South Africa's guidelines and that of other countries may be related to uh, quality gaps in pharmacoeconomic research and in education. Um, for instance, this is a, a paper that was published in Pharmacoeconomics by Gavaza and Rascati uh, in 2012. Uh, they did a systematic review, um, found 108 uh, peer-reviewed publications. All of them were focused on uh, or used uh, health economic methods um, on um, data from South Africa or South African uh, population and uh, their conclusions that they found that half of the, the articles of health economics in South Africa are of good quality uh, suggesting that the other half were, were not good quality but their recommendation was that measures are needed to promote the commissioning of more and better quality health economic and pharmacoeconomic studies in, in South Africa and I think there's a very real opportunity um, going forward to um, and as has already been discussed uh, at the, the level of the ISPO South Africa and also uh, its members is a need for, for greater capacity building, greater education and that's the purpose for this type of, of panel conversation uh, to talk about the, the capacity needs and um, uh, capabilities to evaluate the results of pharmacoeconomic submissions at the level of all stakeholders, Department of Health, medical schemes, um, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers um, too. Uh, what uh, Karen Rascati did together with her, her colleagues as well. They ranked the, the quality of articles on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, where the article was published, the country of residence, the primary training of the author, um, South Africa's blue and uh, the maroon red is uh, international. What they found is that there was a significant, a statistically significant difference in the, the quality of publications based on, on their review. Um, there's been a, a lot of conversation in the, the evidence, um, uh, rather, um, in publications regarding the, the conclusions of, of this paper. I have a couple of uh, thoughts related to that which I've shared in, in other online presentations and webinars too. So in conclusion, uh, this is the, the second last slide. The pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa uh, differ in important areas uh, when compared to other countries. Um, I establishing whether a medicine represents fair value for money and, and this is a direct quote uh, coming from the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa um, establishing whether there is fair value for money may not be immediately achievable in South African in environment given that these differences e exist South African guidelines don't have a societal perspective uh, South African guidelines do not incentivize complex and transparent models. Um, it lacks the integration of equity issues and this refers to uh, the, the uh, policy conflict that exists between national health insurance policy and what is envisaged for introduction into the South African healthcare environment and the activities that are being pursued uh, under the, the pricing committee um, together with um, uh, within the context of the, the private sector. So the, the equity issues to, to consider there and the paper takes up some of those and discusses them in greater detail. Um, the uh, guidelines do not incentivize health insurance companies to disclose claims data. Um, it does not require the inclusion of a budget impact uh, analysis in all submissions and research, further research is also needed on the impact of mandatory guidelines. Um, Malaysia is a country that is comparable to South Africa in the sense that pharmacoeconomic guidelines have been voluntary for some time and there have been ideas to um, uh, make them mandatory however they haven't been able to bridge that divide. Um, so I think further uh, work is needed to better understand what is the, the best route to making guidelines mandatory within an emerging uh, market uh, context, uh, particularly in South Africa, but then also other comparable markets, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, across the, the, the board. Uh, the final um, slide is um, that to note that the, the research 
uh, has answered the question of what the differences are between South Africa's pharmacoeconomic guidelines and other countries. It has partially discussed why these differences uh, exist. So quality gaps in pharmacoeconomic research, for instance, and the the narrow structural focus only on the the private sector um, uh, to the exclusion of of patients and the the public sector uh, may partially explain the these differences. But what this research has not answered is how these differences came about, and uh, this is something that CNC will be pursuing in the f uh, in the future, um, not as part of a of a witch hunt, but more as part of a a process to better understand how are pharmacoeconomic guidelines developed, or more importantly, how is policy developed and the different actors that are involved in developing and drafting um, a policy at the level of the Department of Health and, and its subcommittees. And um, three important points may arise in that type of research is a conflicts of interest. Uh, and I think there's a, a very real potential for conflicts of interest at an individual level to introduce bias into the drafting of pharmacoeconomic guidelines. It may have happened in the past, it may happen in the, in the future. And a, a very real example is if an individual uh, works and consults for government, uh, works and consults for the pharmaceutical industry, works and consults for medical schemes, has a managed care organization and, and other comparable activities, there's a very real potential for a person that wears multiple hats to have a conflict of interest when advising um, a different stakeholders uh, within the, the market. It's these type of conflicts of interest that we need to better understand um, and to improve the transparency around how uh, decisions are made and how drafting is made. Another good example may be, for instance, consultants that are also academics that are also uh, also advise medical schemes, to what extent are, are they in a good position to receive pharmacoeconomic submissions from manufacturers and appropriately uh, evaluate and independently evaluate those submissions and, and make recommendations. Um, I think um, some level of transparency around potential conflicts of interest and how they're being managed um, is, is very useful. Um, this is not taking into account uh, who the current personalities are that are involved at the level of the pricing committee. Uh, these are more fundamental principles that in, in a decade or two decades time or three generations time, uh, for example, are important principles to, to integrate into the pharmacoeconomic guidelines because many of the personalities are involved today in the guidelines will not be around in 2, 10, 15 years time. Um, so hopefully some of these principles will endure um, the lives of, of many individuals. The second concept is uh, the need for good technical governance and due diligence and I, I personally think that the um, pricing committee in particular has failed uh, in its responsibility to uh, undertake a process of due diligence uh, to better understand how uh, pharmacoeconomic guidelines are structured and, and used around the world and to integrate best practice into the South African environment to facilitate the, uh, the submission of pharmacoeconomic guidelines. There's a major gap uh, that I believe of work that uh, was not done at the, the level of the pricing committee or work that still could be done uh, in the future to uh, to improve the, the guidelines. So this would be part of the good technical governance process of consultation, process of knowing who the drafting team is, um, uh, uh, which sources were used, uh, to what extent was an international review done comparable to, to this paper that was published in J JME. And the, the final and the, the third point is uh, private versus public conversations. Um, I engage with uh, client stakeholders um, and, and many groups within the South Africa on a daily basis uh, through the work that I do at CNC. And there are a lot of uh, private thoughts, private opinions related to the pharmacoeconomic guidelines. What would be great is, and sometimes those opinions change, uh, what would be great in the, the future to do is to have more of a shift of private content, uh, private conversations that take place between individuals to rather shift that into the public domain um, and create panel conversations such as this one today at, at Ispo South Africa uh, to have a public, frank and open conversation around what the personal thoughts are of leading individuals around uh, the development of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines, taking into account conflicts of interest, due diligence, uh, the involvement of, of current individuals and what work could be done in the, in the 
future. And um, I think this is a, about leadership um, in the sense that uh, ISPOL South Africa chapter has already provided the, the leadership in establishing this panel to facilitate that conversation. Uh, CNC organized a webinar uh, last week, uh, last week Thursday, uh, where we shared the, the results of the JME paper uh, with colleagues ar around the, the world that connected from the, the webinar. Um, so it's this type of, of public conversations that, that I think uh, is important of shifting away from, from private vacillating opinions to rather public uh, opinions and having some leadership in the space uh, to move us forward uh, with the intention of delivering better value to South African uh, patients and importantly appropriately evaluating the economic contribution of new healthcare technologies as they are introduced into the South African space. So with that as the, uh, the concluding remarks, um, a very big thank you again to ISPO South Africa chapter uh, for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts um, and um, I'm reachable through uh, webpage carapino.com or alternatively you can reach uh, me or any of our team members through our Boston office, uh, Joburg office uh, 087. If you happen to be traveling through Bahrain uh, or the, the Middle East then we're available through our Manama uh, switchboard number uh, or our York number if you're in Europe uh, or if you're in the UK. So thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, you taking time to listen to this and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.